Let's turn in the word of the Lord to James chapter five. I do want to agree that if you're here today with a need, situation in your life, hungry for God, in any of those levels, I believe he's here for us today. God doesn't take off for the holidays. It doesn't take him two weeks to catch back up after Thanksgiving. God's here. His presence is here, and he, he's going to minister to us today. James chapter 5, verse 13, 14, and 15. I want you to notice this. Is any among you afflicted? That word afflicted means suffering, in trouble, facing challenges, difficulties. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. If you've committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. I want to read that again, but I'm going to emphasize just a couple of words that I want you to notice a contrast in these verses. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray. There are some circumstances where the situation is pushing you to a place where you're the one being called on to go somewhere in prayer. There's other situations where you get the phone out and say, hey, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? But there's some where God's saying, it's not time to pick up the phone and call them it's time for you to pray. One version said, is any among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone sick? Then he must call for the elders and they are to pray. I believe there's even times that it's both. Y'all pray, I'm praying. But when it's Certain situations, I want us to consider that God may even be allowing those situations because he's leading us to a personal breakthrough. He's allowing things to happen so that we will pray. So I want us to consider for a few moments this morning, if I can say it like this, there are times that God will build a prayer room for our lives. But I want to minister today on the subject, I'll build it myself. Thank you. I'm not going to wait for him to have to build all the circumstances for me to find an altar. I'll build it myself. Thank you. God bless, and you may be seated. That's it. Let's just talk to the Lord one more time, standing or seated. Lord, we honor you, Jesus. We submit to you and your word today. Amen. Let your word work. Let your spirit work. Let your ministry take place in this house in an absolutely beautiful way. We submit to your presence. We submit to your purpose. Amen. Let beautiful, sweet, precious prayer breakthroughs happen in this room, in this altar, amen, in the next few moments of this service, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless, and you may be seated. Now, I was raised just a few miles from here, down the interstate, over the interstate there in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Our church was kind of old school. The sanctuary 
I, I love the, the connectivity and the closeness of one, two, three, four, five sections here kind of wrapped around the front of the platform. Our church was old school. One center aisle, long, skinny sanctuary, two sections. And, and, and anybody remember the churches that were built like that? I mean, you weren't a Pentecostal church if your church wasn't mauve, rust, or gold, huh? Yeah, aqua, uh, yeah, so they're like four colors. You wasn't even anointed if you didn't have one of those colors. Two sections, long sanctuary, and my pastor, he never said it was a doctrine. He never said it was, it was just a personal belief that he had that the young people would pay more attention and the youth group would be better connected if the young people set up front. And I like to see young people sitting up front. As I got a little older, I realized the closer I got to the front, the, the, the less I had to look at the back of other people's heads. And I could just get right up front and, and focus on God. And, but he, he wanted all of us to sit on the front two pews. He took it even further. He wanted all the young men to sit on one side. We were segregated. And all the young ladies to sit on the other side. I was raised. That's how I was raised. Sunday morning, Sunday night church. Sunday night was the big deal back in those days. The choir sang. I mean, Sunday morning we were, you know, we were prim and proper. We had, you know, more guests. Sunday night was, it was us church and it was on. I mean, it was shout downs and all that stuff. And, and I'll never forget uh, I mean, you call it sneak a peek, whatever you want to do. But we, we would go home, us guys would go home with cricks in our necks from worshiping God and checking out the girls. We did, we did this the whole service. Amen. And, and being normal, I guess, young people, you know, pastor wanted us to sit on the front. I mean, that's way up front, right there. And, and so... A couple people sat on the first row, maybe. Some would sometimes sit on the second. And I guess it was good psychology because the pastor said if I ask for the first two rows, they'll sit on the third, fourth, and fifth. And he has us way further up front than the back, you know. And so, so we sat, most of us sat on the third row, the fourth row. And, um, and then there were some. And in, in, in our youth group at the time, like, most of the young men were a few years older than me. When I was 14, 15, there was a big pack of, of young men that was 17, 18, 16, just a little bit older than me in, in, in the church at that time. And there was a, a crew that sat halfway back or further back. Now, again, I'm not judging your spirituality. I'm not asking anybody, oh, my goodness, you are on the back section. You are, you are cold. You're lukewarm. N nothing to do with that. But our pastor had said this is where he wanted us to sit. And at that time, you could just about take a, a thermometer, and I promise you the ones that were sitting in the back third of the they weren't real hot for God. All right? I'm not judging anybody here. But I'm just telling you, that's how it was in that situation. And I'll, I'll never forget some of those Sunday nights. I, just, I, I know we had good church on the Sunday mornings, but those Sunday nights, and pastor would preach sometimes conviction, and, and then other times it would be just, just worship and praise. And, and, and I was one, uh, I'm not, I was one, that I wasn't real strong in my walk for God, but when God moved, I responded. And I remember when the conviction, does anybody know what I mean when I say old-fashioned conviction, just that, that tug that it's not so much what the preacher's saying, it's like God's hand reaches in your heart and pulls and and, and I couldn't say no to that. And I remember I, 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 I would just go to that altar and cry. Now, I may not do good three days later being, being solid for God, but I couldn't say no. And I remember, I mean, we, we had a Christian school, so we were together almost all the time, that group. But I remember conversations, and it was a consistent theme among some of those a little bit older. And the theme was this. 
I really wanted to go pray. I mean, you call it white knuckling it. They're grabbing the pew. They have tears trying to come out, but they won't go to the altar. And several of them said, I, I, I wanted to go pray. God's presence was on me, but I know I'm not ready to live it right now. And so I didn't want to go up front and pray knowing I'm not ready to live it. As I've gotten older, I, I've looked back and I realized I would rather have a heart that is tender to God, even if I don't have it all figured out yet. Amen. Then to tell God no when his presence is moving. Please understand, every time you tell God no, it's another layer that can come over your heart. I don't want to get used to telling God no. I don't want to get used to saying, God, you're moving, you're stirring me, you're working on me, but I'm not ready to pray right now. And I've looked back over time and some of those young men, it just became layers and then their hearts became so hard and they ended up not serving the Lord. So I just encourage us today, when God moves, let me just say it this way, there's nothing like a good old praying through at an altar. There's nothing like a good old fasting, crying, weeping, being drawn by God's presence until you, uh, you say, Brother Greg, is that just for the young people? No, all of us, when God moves, when God draws, when he puts his hand inside of your chest and you have that feeling, I've got to lay before the Lord. I've got to kneel before the Lord. I've got to pray until something happens. There's nothing. There's nothing that can take the place of those moments. There was one young man in that same youth group, and he was a couple years younger than me. But he, he was fun, hung out with some of us that were a little older than him. Again, life moved on. He married, moved different state, and attended, I guess you could call it a Pentecostal light church. You know, still believed in outward worship, but a lot of the consecrations and commitments and Different things no longer important. Some of the doctrines, you know, just a kind of a Pentecostal church, if you can say it like that. Attended that for years. Told me when we would talk several times, well, well, I like it, but it's a little bit more like production than than the old moves of God that we used to have. He he shared different things with me through the years, but he shared one thing that really touched my heart because one time he he was visiting family for the holidays back in Baton Rouge in the meantime our old home sanctuary the first Pentecostal church there had sold that building and that campus to another denomination to another church and they had moved to a new new location and he just wanted to go visit his old home church. He told me this. We still close and connect and communicate. And so he went just to be in the parking lot, just to be on the property of where he was raised. And he said there was a maintenance man working out in the yard, and he said they talked for a little bit, and, and the maintenance man said, well, hey, I got the keys. Would you like to go inside? He said, I would. He said, I figured that. He said, a lot of y'all come back here from time to time, and almost all of y'all want to go inside. And the maintenance man opened the doors. No choir, no preacher, no pool of peers praying. My friend told me he made his way to the altar, and he raised his hands, and he began to tell God, can I just feel what I used to felt? what I used to feel, would you just let me feel what I used to feel when we would 
pray and preach and your presence with me. He's going to church every Sunday. <coughs> but he's asking God, would you let me feel what I used to feel in this altar? Because he wasn't feeling that every Sunday now. That moved me so deeply. He said tears flowed down his cheeks. And he reached up to the presence. Let me tell you something this morning. You may not remember what I say. You may not remember messages. Amen. I'd love to think Brother Jared does a great job and that you could tell him, you could just walk up and he'd say, hey, what did I speak on the last eight Sundays? And you could rattle them off, but I doubt it. If you ever want your bubble busted, your family at lunch, what did I preach about? And they go, oh, it was good, Daddy. You may not remember what we say. But you're never going to forget. You're never going to forget. And, and, and please understand, I, I know you can go back and pull some messages that impacted your life and touched your life. And you can remember some words and, and, and acts of love. But, but you know what you're going to remember the most through life? You're going to remember those times. I'm not just talking about the first time you came to the Lord. I'm talking about your family's going through a tough spot. I'm talking about you're in the middle of a battle or a trial, and you feel God wooing you, and you feel his presence drawing you, and you step out, and you make your way, and you have a good prayer meeting, a, a breakthrough. Amen. Others may be praying, but the circumstances brought you to a place of a prayer breakthrough. You'll never forget that. You'll never forget the beauty, the pre preciousness of those moments. Amen. Can we pause for just a moment right now? There's a sweetness in this room. There's a sweetness of God's presence in this room. I, I believe somebody's going to have one of those God moments today. I, I believe somebody's going to have, have time in, in the altar today with Jesus. Amen. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sometimes. Sometimes, and can I end that story by just saying that friend's back in a full-on apostolic church where he gets to experience that every week. Sometimes, you're just one good prayer meeting away. One good altar service away. One good Holy Ghost breakthrough away. Amen. From what you need in your life. I want to look for a few moments at a man named Jonah. Jonah is an interesting story in the Bible. I just want to walk through some verses, minister from this story for a little while, and, and notice some things very vital to our message today. Verse 1 of chapter 1. You'll see it on the screen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. He said, arise. Now, this is, a, this is a, a, a large, heavy calling that God put, a challenging calling that God put on Jonah. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Nineveh was a... a leading city, so much merchandise and trade, and, and the Bible says it was very wicked, large city. Verse three, I mean, God's told Jonah, arise, go, and preach, cry against it. Jonah did what any apostolic called preacher would do. Bible says, he rose up to flee from Tarshish 
from the presence of the Lord. I'm, I'm just kidding a little bit. Jonah said, I'm not going there. That's too scary. That's too big. I'm running the opposite direction. That's actually human nature. A lot of times when something's tough, our human nature says, uh, you really? I'm going to run as fast and as far away as I can get from that. But he didn't just run from Tarshish. He ran from the presence of the Lord. He found a ship. He paid the, the or actually he's trying to go unto Tarshish, fleeing Nineveh. And so he's fleeing. Notice the end of verse three, he's trying to get away from this challenge and he actually flees from the presence of the Lord. I don't see in these verses that Jonah said, before I make such a decision, I need to pray. I'm gonna ask God for help. If God's given me an assignment, he's gonna give me the anointing. If God believes I can do this or go through this, then he's going to empower me. I don't find where Jonah prayed. The Bible says, notice this in verse four. Somebody notice it with me. But the Lord sent a great wind. Who sent the great wind? The Lord. Now, this is not the focus of our message today, but anybody ever tried to run from the Lord and he was in front of you and said, okay, uh, and, 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 and you could run as fast as you wanted to run and when you stopped, he, he can put a storm right in front of you? Yeah, he's good like that. He can do that. The Lord sent out a great wind. There was a mighty tempest in the sea. God, if I can word it this way, is saying, Jonah, I've got a calling on your life. And if you're going to run from it, then I'm going to start a little construction project. And I'm going to build you a prayer room. Jonah, I'm going to allow situations to come. That's going to, I'm, I'm not trying to just force you to go to Nineveh. I am trying to get you to a place of prayer where then you're happy to go to Nineveh and do my will. And so God sent the wind. The storm began to arise. Jonah is on this ship trying to make his way to Tarshish. Notice verse 5. The mariners, God, that did this every day, they're now afraid. Every one of them is praying. They're crying out to his God. They're throwing things off of the ship, trying to lighten the load. But Jonah, I mean, the guys working on the ship are praying. But Jonah, he goes down into the sides of the ship and he tries to sleep it off. Now, just for thought, sometimes we'll try to run from God and sometimes it gets heavy and we just get all oppressed and try to sleep it off. Uh, they're all praying. Jonah's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. Everybody's praying but him. He ran, he slept, but what he didn't do was pray. And sometimes, somebody hear me today, sometimes the only thing that will work, sometimes the only thing that will work is an old-fashioned Holy Ghost, led of God, gonna pray until something happens, prayer meeting. Amen. And so they lead the, 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 the people on the ship, the mariners, begin to ask Jonah questions. And he said, oh, I fear God. I honor God. But they, they know. He shares. I'm fleeing. I'm, I'm running from the presence of God. And you work down the story. Jonah said, it's, it's because of me that y'all are in this storm. And they tried. Jonah's like, throw me overboard. It's my fault. Can somebody hear me for a moment? He's, he's willing to be thrown overboard to try to help this situation. I don't, I don't, I don't quite understand. This is a stubborn man. I think I'd be saying, guys, I think it's my fault. If y'all give me 15 minutes, I'm going to go downstairs and have a prayer meeting, and I ain't coming back until I get this right, and we're going to figure it out. Instead, he's like, y'all throw me out. You're a man of God. You're running. You're sleeping. 
Now you're trying to just say, get rid of me. But he didn't say, I'm going to have a prayer meeting. And so they tried so hard in verse 13 to row the ship to land, but they couldn't. The storm is getting worse. And God's saying, I'm working on my little construction project. I'm stirring it up a little bit worse. Verse 15, chapter one. They finally said, you're the problem. They took Jonah, cast him into the sea. Immediately, the sea stopped her raging. Those men, they feared the Lord. They began to offer sacrifices. They began to commit to the Lord. Now, verse 17, remember God sent the storm a few verses ago? Now, verse 17, the Lord prepared a great fish. God said, I, I got the next level of this construction project. Here it comes. And a great fish swallowed up Jonah. And he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. Really? It took all that. Please understand, I've been stubborn in my life. I, I'm not just knocking on Jonah only. But it took all that for him to say, I'm ready. I'll talk to Jesus until something happens. I'll pray until something shifts. I'll, I'll get a hold of God until a fresh anointing comes that changes the atmosphere and changes my life. Then Jonah prayed. Look at verse two, and I want you to notice this. I cried by reason of my affliction. There's that word from our text. Is any afflicted? Let him pray. He said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I, and he heard my voice. Can I preach for just a couple minutes? I'm almost done this morning. Some of you need to quit cursing the challenge that you're walking through right now and you need to embrace it and say well God maybe you're just working in my family maybe you're just working in my life maybe you've just allowed oh I love it when the prayers get answered on the first in Jesus name but what if it don't what if it stays tough what if the challenges sometimes seem to just be on every side God may be saying I'm taking you to another level it's time for you to lock in. It's time for you to get a hold of me. It's quit cursing the pain. Quit cursing the challenge. Quit cursing what you've walked through. That affliction may be your salvation. That trouble may be your greatest blessing. Jonah said, I pray. It took a storm. It took three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. Then Jonah prayed. I've decided if God wants to get me to pray, he can get me to pray. If he wants me to a place of breakthrough, he can get me there. He can build a prayer room, but I've decided, God, amen, I don't want you to have to go to those measures to get me to say, okay, I'm all yours. Whatever you got to say, what does it take to move you? Scripture in 1 Kings, man of God in a cave, and God said, go stand out before the Lord. And a strong wind came. It said it broke the rocks. That's a strong wind. But God was not in the wind. Then an earthquake. Then a fire. And it said God wasn't in those. But he was in the still, small voice. Question. Does it take a tornado for God to talk to me? I know this is a little different this morning. 
His sweet presence is here. Does, does it take? Does it take a catastrophe for him to talk to me? Does, does it take the ravaging fires for me to say, okay, I want to be in a place where his still small voice, I'll go to the altar. I'll call on your name. I'll cry out to you. If you're allowing this affliction to drive me, I get it. I'll build my own prayer room. Thank you. In that group of friends, many of them backslid, I mentioned that. Most of that group older than me, we lost a large portion. Fast forwarding a little bit through time, 18, 19 is when I had my life conversion call to ministry. And somewhere in that next year or two, God put a burden on my heart for that group. Put 10 of them's name on an index card, carried in my pocket every day, prayed for them. And in one, one season, I felt the Lord nudge me one at a time, find where they work, find their home, go visit them, just love on them, just let them know you're there, praying for them, thinking about them one at a time. So I went to the first one, had a great visit, but in that visit, because what's weird is when they were in church, they weren't all super close, but when they got out of church, they were a pack. They were close. And I guess I said something to the first one that I'm going to be visiting all of y'all. I don't know. I must have said something like that. Because when I went to go see the second guy, he, um, he said, Mike told me what you're doing. You come see me, but don't talk about God and don't talk about church and don't bring up any of that. I said, all right, bud, I just, I just want to visit y'all and spend a little time, and I'll, I'll commit. I won't bring up all of that. And I went and sat and talked about fishing, talked about his job, but I didn't talk about God, and I didn't talk about the church. He was bitter, had things in his heart. So I just tried to love on him. Over time, visited a few more. Fast forward a few years. I'm evangelizing somewhere across the country. Life has gone a little bit, you know, just, just, just a few more years. And I heard that that guy now has terminal illness. He's dying, months to live. Grown young man now, and is probably in his 30s. In the last few months of his life, moved back home to live with his parents to help provide care. Still, hard heart, don't talk to me about God. Don't talk to me about the church. Two nights before he died, his parents were already in bed. They were asleep or just about asleep late at night. On the floor, he had gathered the strength to get out of his bed and crawl to their bedroom and laying on the floor, pulling on their bedspread, could barely whisper, Mom, Dad, I want to get right with God. And on the floor in their bedroom with hardly strength of life left in him, he had a breakthrough and he cried and prayed and was renewed in the Holy Ghost. And God in his mercy restored that man's soul. And 48 hours later, he's in eternity and I believe he'll spend eternity with God 
forever. Amen. And that's a beautiful story, and I'm grateful for it. But I don't want to have to wait till I'm 48 hours from eternity with a fatal illness in my body for me to say, okay, God. Okay, God, I'll listen now. Okay, God, I'll have a tender. I don't want to have to be in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights to say, God, I'll listen. Would you stand with me right now? I want to have a heart that says, when you move, I want to respond. When your presence is there, I want to pray. When your spirit is there, I want to pray. Amen. Would you take a moment right now and just close your eyes and lift your hands to the heavens. There's a tenderness here right now. There's a sweetness here right now. I hope it's greater and stronger than anything I could say. I pray it's that hand reaching through your ribs into your spiritual chest, that hand of God finding that heart, finding your the core of your life and just drawing. Amen, God. I pray in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Come with me right now, young man. Now, if you do me a favor, I want y'all, I'm not trying to embarrass this young man, but when I just looked down, he just exemplified everything that I'm trying to say about what's right. Would you just pray with me like you were just praying? Amen. His hands were lifted. Just reach out. This is what he was doing on the front row. Y'all weren't looking, but I looked down and saw it. I said, that's what I'm talking about. A young man that just says, God's presence is moving. A young man that just said, God's spirit's in the atmosphere. Young man, would you just reach out to the Lord right now? Young ladies, would you reach out to the Lord right now? Families, would you reach out? He was just shaking his head back and forth forth, his hands lifted, having his, I'm probably embarrassing him a little bit, but he just crying out to God, saying, God, on a Sunday morning after Thanksgiving, your presence is in the house. I can't tell you no. I'm not going to say no. I'm not going to let a layer be on my heart. Thank you. Would you take the hand of your neighbor right now? Lift it to the heavens. It don't have to take long, but somebody needs a breakthrough. You can pray yourself, and a friend can pray for you right now. This can be one of those moments that both happen. Somebody needs a prayer breakthrough. Some dad needs a touch from heaven. Some mom needs grace from the throne room. Some young adult needs something from Jesus right now. Don't tell him no. Thank you, buddy. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name. Young man, if it's been a little while, get you a prayer breakthrough today. Don't be one of those that say, ah, I don't have it all figured out right now. I can't pray today. I don't know if I'm ready. No, I would encourage you, pray anyway, and God will help you get ready. Ha <laughs> ha. Come on, mom. Come on, dad. Come on, families. Yes, yes. Ya rabba shando rabba bashata from the front row to the back. Let a prayer anointing come on you. I know it's easy to pick that phone up and call everybody else, but sometimes you got to pray until something happens. Don't mean it's a sin to pick up the phone and ask somebody else to pray, but sometimes you got to pray until something happens. You got to pray until heaven breaks through. You got to pray until hell breaks off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's it, sweetheart. That's it. Oh, my good. Yes. Ah. You'll never forget these moments. You may forget a sermon, but you're not going to forget what happens in an altar. My friend found his way to that altar. Wasn't a choir, wasn't a preacher, wasn't a friend in the building. But he stood there saying, God, can I please just feel what I used to feel? Can I feel what I used to feel?
Let that happen today. Let that happen today. It's a Holy Ghost moment. It's a God moment for you. It's a God moment for you. Have a God moment. Yes, yes, yes. Front row to the back. You just have you a God moment right now. Have you a God moment right now? Ah, church, be sensitive right now. Maybe find somebody to move over and pray with for a moment. God knows you. Just be sensitive right now. Church, be sensitive. There may be somebody close to you who just needs a hand on their shoulder right now. They're praying, but you can encourage them. Yes. Let that heart cry come out right now. Let those holy tears fall down your cheeks right now. Let that cry of the soul come out right now. Let that cry of the soul come out right now. Hallelujah. 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 Let that cry of the soul come out right now. Well, Brother Greg, I don't have it figured out. I would encourage you. Don't think you have to have it all figured out to have a good prayer meeting. Cry out to God. God bless our friend. You heard him? Cry out. You don't have your understanding? Cry out. You're up against something? Cry out. Hallelujah to Jesus. Holy Holy Ghost come in this house. Holy Ghost come in this house. Bless you. Virtue flow right now. Virtue in his body, in his mind, in his soul, in his physical body, in his spiritual body. Yes! We pray. We pray. Yeah. We pray. It said, Jonah prayed. Pour your spirit out. Then Jonah prayed. I don't want to have to wait for all that. Bless you. Oh, I'm good. God bless our friends. Bless their homes, their lives, their steps. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app 
or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.